So yes, we're going to talk about CCTVX uh, Expel for the next couple of hours. Um, I'm really going to get into some details here, but here's what I want you to know first. There's a tutorial, there's a website for CCTVX. The way you find it, just go on the, uh, well, let's see, get this. Oh. Do this ahead of time. Not what I want to do, so I'm going to send this window up here. So I can just find it. it doesn't. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. So, all right. I, I'm not going to try to. Oh, oh. Yeah. It should be like this. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm not going to emphasize this, but it, if you go to the home page of my group, cci.lbl.gov, and then down to CCTVX Expel. Here's our, our wiki. And then right here, 2014 workshop tutorial, and also the PowerPoint presentation. So if you want to get the PowerPoint that I'm showing right now, it's right here. And here's the tutorial. Um, I hope you all check this out. Um, and I'll say more about that in a bit. But let me go back. Now the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. All right. And I, you know I'm not going to talk at all about releases and licenses and GNU licenses. Uh, we we haven't released the software yet. It's simply there at Slack. Um, it's in a common location that everyone can see, and you can just use it. And at some point in the future, it may be that you can download this and run it on your machines at home. But we're not really at that point yet. Okay. So what can we do with CCTBX Expel? We've processed a number of data sets with it, so Lysozyme in particular, um, and also um, the SOI paper that uh, was referred to earlier, the delta endotoxin. Um, we processed it both actually with CCTBX and CRISPR, so there's a comparison there. The Helen Ginn uh, data set that we talked about before, that's the polyhedron. Uh, just submitted. Uh, that was also CCTVX, and also the Photosystem 2 work that we've been doing and Thermolysin that we've sort of relied on heavily as a uh, 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 an example that we could use for methods development. And all of this, I, I just should mention different methods of delivering the sample. Uh, the GDVM, which is very commonly used. Uh, and then the electrospun uh, microjet, which actually Raymond Sierra here can talk to you about. And the advantage of that was that it, I, I think, among several advantages, it uses about tenfold less sample. So it's maybe intermediate between the toothpaste injector and uh, the free flowing nozzle. But it, it was a way for us to be able to study the photosystem uh, with only about 100 microliters of sample uh, over a five day period. I'm not sure if I got those numbers right, but it's it's uh, worth considering because it's available uh, to people who are doing screening studies. Um, so that's what we've done. Uh, this is sort of the extent of what we can see. Um, you know, the, the question is, can we process data accurately enough to measure small differences, such as anomalous differences, um, for sad phasing? We haven't done sad phasing with. Um, the CCTVX, but we have in anomalous difference Fourier maps, we've detected the zinc metal and also the calcium metals in thermal isen, and also the, the manganese atoms in photosystem two. And actually, Carol Nass, have you actually used CCTVX to solve the gadolinium lysozyme? Um, no. No, well then that's a challenge for the students today <laughs> because we have the data, we have the gadolinium data, we have CCTVX. The question is can anyone actually go through the whole thing and process and get enough signal to actually do the sad phasing uh, today or tomorrow? So um, please go to the website and get right to it. Um, <laughs> in fact, um, so you know, let me, this slide kind of lays out 
This is more or less a glossary of the terms that you need to know to understand the rest of my talk. So I don't want to rush through this slide. I want to go through it very uh, methodically. This is basically a workflow um, that you're going to need to process data with CCTVX. So starting from the original data, this is the raw file that Anton Vardy was speaking of earlier, um, streamed out by the data acquisition system in XTC format. What is XTC? Extensible tagged container, but it doesn't matter to us. It's just a, a big bucket that you can stream through in a serial way and get out the information that's been written to these files. All the way to final structure solution. So I want to kind of lay out how this is organized for you. If you log in, to PS login, um, uh, as per the instructions here, you'll be able to see in a shared directory, that, which all the students here have access to. Um, it's, on a, it's on a file system. CXI is just the, the beamline. Uh, uh, there's a separate area for each uh, instrument. And then this is the experiment name, CXI 84914, that corresponds to this class. And then there's always an XTC directory. It's a read-only directory uh, that has your data, or in this case, the data from the tutorial examples uh, for this experiment. And then, um, as discussed before, there's a special uh, file naming convention for these data blocks. So E is experiment number. So our thermal license data is experiment number 157. As discussed before, these are runs. So this is this one in particular is run 21. And I agree with Anton's uh, comment. You should have a Google Doc when you're collecting this data, which will define what samples were in each run. Um, in the case of the tutorial, you actually have to go in and discover what's in the run, because we don't tell you at the very beginning. And then, uh, as discussed, the data are multiplexed among different streams. And then uh, after the files get to be a certain size, they're chunked. So uh, you know, as chunk zero uh, gets to be uh, bigger than a certain threshold, chunk one is started. So there's just a list of um, read-only data here. Then we're going to go to indexing and integration. And actually, this arrow, there's a lot of other steps in here, too, such as dark subtraction and um, correcting for um, pixels which are untrusted, such as hot pixels and so forth. And that will be discussed in the tutorial. But just sort of in broad stroke, there's an index and integration step. And here, the so I'll, I'll tell you first where the results are written to. As I said, this is a directory that's unique to our experiment. And we're going to look in the same directory now, but now in the scratch area. Now, that's not read-only. The scratch area, anybody in the experiment, that means all the students here, for example, can write to the scratch area. So that's where we're going to be writing our results. And I'll just show how we organize it in CCTVX. In your scratch area, there will be um, a section that's divided into different runs. So when we process run 21, we'll also have a separate scratch directory also for run 21. And in CCTVX, we organize, let's say we process the data and we, we integrate the data. That's trial zero. Then maybe we'll change our parameters and change our spot size or something. That'll be trial one. And then we'll, we'll do different data processing trials with sequentially numbered uh, directory. So this is 000, then there'll be 001, etc. Now within those directories, there's a standard out directory that gives you the log file, which has a lot of information about the integration. Then the output, the out directory and the integration directory. So here, as I said before, this XTC contains the raw data. Here are going to be images that have been read in by our program dark corrected, and also untrusted pixels will be flagged. And those images are now going to be written out to a pickle file. Pickle is a way in Python of just dumping out a lot of data. It could be binary data. In this case, it's image data. Uh, so that's how we store the individual images now that we've selected uh, hits that we integrated. We write them out as pickle files. Um, and then the actual reflections, the structure factors that we measure, are written out um, in a separate directory called the integration directory, also in pickle format, but it's a completely different 
pickle formula. So here, this little bit here describes how we organize our software. We didn't write uh, something like Cheetah that would take data and put it into a format that you could take at home. What we did instead was we used tools that were provided by Slack. So there's an API or program uh, called Piana, which allows us to unpack the data in the XTC stream. So we just write our CCTBX modules and we plug them into Piana. So since there are two bits of software working together, there's actually two files that define the parameters that we're using. There's both a configuration file that we need to know about that describes things to Piana, such as where is the dark image going to come from, or how many, uh, you know, what is the correction factor I need to correct the energy or the distance of the detector. Those parameters are put in the configuration file. Then also for the CCTBX module, we're going to talk a lot about fill files. This is basically keywords and values that we use in our software, CCTBX, to define the parameters that we are going to use for processing data. Things like uh, spot size that Aaron will be talking about um, later on. Okay, all of these all these parameter files are written in your own user directory. Um, here's how it's organized. You have a login area. I just use dollar user for that. Under dollar user, you're going to have to create a my release. This is a very special directory, and the instructions to set it up are actually given in this tutorial. There's a there's a link on the 2014 tutorial called Getting Started, and you, you must go through these steps. In fact, you must also do this. Um, uh, I actually I don't know how cheated it is. I guess it's it's completely standalone. Is that correct? In any case, in order to use Piana at all uh, to process data, you have to go through this process of creating this directory, and any Piana process has to be run through here. Then underneath that, I've made an experimental directory, and that's where we're going to put all the parameter files. The other thing that you need to know is for most of this work, we're going to be using batch queues at Slack. And as mentioned before, I think the batch queue that you should have tested out already is PSANA CSQ. OK, so that's all very interesting. That's how we process the XTC streams. But as I said, we also write out the data afterwards into pickle files. And there, we can use our CCTBX tools to integrate data also in, in a standalone fashion. So once we've taken the data out and corrected it, we can do the same things we were doing within Piana. We can do those separately. So convenient things like viewing an image, or that's the CCTBX image viewer, or integrating the image using CXI index, and also viewing the spots um, and the integration masks at the same time. That's done in a standalone fashion on these pickle files. We also need a fill file. Just like I said, the fill file <coughs> defines the integration parameters for our CCTBX software. So you need the same fill file here when you do standalone indexing. After all is said and done, we take all the integration pickles that contain the structure factors. We merge them together. We make an MTZ file. And then you can just uh, do a copy over your laptop and do molecular replacement or hopefully SAT phasing uh, with Phoenix on, on your own laptop. So that's that's the intention. That's what we're going to be doing. So uh, what do I hope to accomplish with this? Um, I've put the thermal ISIN data online. And I would say this is the first time that we've actually wrote down all the steps uh, for users to take absolutely raw XTC files without even knowing things like the metrology and so forth. Uh, you can work that all out for yourself, and we have all the tools to do that. The question is, will it work? I, I think uh, we've been developing this all up to the last, the last hours before the workshop. So does it work at all? And can you detect an anomalous signal from the zinc metal in our thermal isen, or actually from the gadolinium? We don't know those answers yet. We haven't done it yet. <laughs> Um, so we'd like some ambitious students to try that. And for that reason, I say start tonight. Don't wait for me to give the tutorial tomorrow. 
because it'll be too late because the two hour session we have tomorrow, I'm going to be talking for half of it anyway. And you're not going to have a chance to, to do all these processes. But if you can at least start, get a feel uh, for what the tutorial says to do, it's just basically a list of instructions for going through the process. Um, in many cases, it takes too long to calculate, uh, for example, the darks. So take the dark that I've calculated already. Just use dollar user equals NK solder and take my results and use those. Um, <clears throat> and in so doing, I hope that you're going to figure out questions that we haven't really answered in the tutorial so that by the time we're done tomorrow, we get all the answers and we put them on the wiki. And you know, if you brought your own data, maybe this would be a good time to try out the program to see if it works. Extended topics, you know, Aaron Brewster is going to talk in a bit about different parameters for data processing. He's actually processed data at SACLA using the same software, so he can tell you about that offline. Wolfgang Graham is going to talk later about solving lattice ambiguities. Oliver Zeldin is going to talk also in the CCTVX context about characterizing data, sparse data in particular. And Chris O'Grady is going to talk a little bit about, I think tomorrow, we're going to be actually changing this framework from PyAna to something else called PSAna. It's mainly stuff that we're interested in under the hood. The, um, the user shouldn't see an effect from that, but we'll, we'll see. So that's, that's uh, where we're going in the workshop. And now I'm going to shift gears and talk about our experiences over the last three years, uh, how difficult it is to process XFEL data and to try to maybe address some of the questions that have been asked up until now in the workshop. <clears throat> so this is something we realized as soon as we started processing data, there's something wrong. We're collecting 10,000 images, we're, we're taking repeat measurements of, the, of Miller indices, maybe a thousand of them, and averaging them all together. And when we when we take each Miller index, like this one here is the 228, and we make a histogram of the values that we measure on different images. This is after they're scaled together. This is what we get. Now, what do, what do we expect to get? Well, we're, we're measuring the same thing over and over again, the structure factor, the structure factor intensity. So we expect to see a distribution. Maybe it's a, a Gaussian with a nice mean and a standard deviation. And that standard deviation will give us something that will indicate in some way what is the... And do the size scan, the size of crystal. Yeah, so this, what I'm showing here is after we've determined a linear scale factor that applies to the whole image. Yes, so the how answer is yes. How do you find the linear scale factor for the whole image? Yes, well, we have a trick, right? We, uh, we scale each image to an isomorphous reference that was collected out of synchrotron. Ah, oh, that's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cheating, but it's what we use for methods development. And it, it illustrates the difficulties here. We do have scaling software, actually, Johan <coughs> implemented it, that doesn't use an isomorphous reference, but that's, that's layered. Okay, so let's do this first. Is that Yeah, the, the answer is no. Uh, we've tested it. Um, we we can uh, we can we can answer later. I mean, the, the quick answer is that we've put in biased models, such as something with an amino acid mutation, and when we get out, we can actually see the differences between what our model put in and the actual intensities. So it doesn't, it does not introduce amplitude bias. Can you use this problem of scattering in each to scale the crystal size? No. No. This is good. I'm glad you're asking questions. This is, <laughs> this is what we want from a workshop. Um, I mean, does anyone see the problem with this? But all of these, all these measurements are clustered around zero. Okay, so we have a big sort of it looks like a Gaussian centered at zero, which would indicate to me that we're measuring zero many, many, many times. And then there are a few measurements where we're actually measuring real intensities, and we average all of this together, and we say that's our structure factor intensity. But I think what this is, what this says to me is that in addition to 
Gaussian distributed errors, like you know, Poisson errors, there's a lot of systematic errors that we don't really have a handle on. And I can't even begin to estimate the, uh, the estimated error of this structure factor intensity until I get a handle on, or maybe correct all the, all the systematic errors. And I have to say, this is after we've applied many of the corrections already. Okay, and I'm gonna, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna tell about the corrections we've already applied, and yet we still get this. So we're not, we're not at the end of, of the effort yet to improve uh, the, the methods. Uh, but this is sort of what I think is probably happening. This is a very old slide. Uh, what we do for integration is we try to, um, when we integrate the data, the data, the, the Bragg spot is this white uh, area, and we actually uh, construct a mask, uh, similar methods that have already been described. We try to make the mask as small as possible so that it's just the same size um, as the Bragg spot. And this is based on bright spots in the surrounding uh, areas. Um, and here, the lattice model is predicting a position for that mask, which is only about one pixel off, but we're really missing the intensities. The, the blue mask doesn't match up with the white spot. So that's what I think is happening. We're getting very biased uh, measurements in many cases. So yeah, as I say here, it's very susceptible to positional error. So that's one thing, and that kind of leads us down the path to discussing metrology. Um, and you know, this, this detector is no, uh, <laughs> this is no commercial product that's nicely been calibrated at the factory. Uh, the necessity has been pointed out before um, of integrating the signal over a 50 femtosecond uh, time scale and then reading out at 120 frames per second. This could only be done with a specially designed detector. Also, it has to work in vacuum. Uh, so that's the Cornell Slack detector. Um, as has been said, these quadrants can be repositioned uh, anytime you do an experiment. And also, because of damage, these, sens these silicon sensor tiles are taken out and replaced. So it's basically every time you collect data, it's a new detector. We have to redetermine the exact positions. And as, as I indicated on this picture, we're interested in finding these positions to, to pixel accuracy and sub-pixel accuracy. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, here's the first of several tools we use to do it. We just have a GUI. We know we can reposition the quadrants, so we take the quadrants as a block. The picture that you're seeing here is thermal isen diffraction, but averaged over you know the whole run. So thousands of thermal isen crystals have gone through, and we've uh, we've added them all up and created a powder pattern and it's not concentric. And we can make it concentric by changing the x and y coordinates of these quadrants. So we actually have uh, spin bars here, spin widgets, that allow us to uh, move them around. The other thing this allows us to do is to get some calibration of the detector distance, because the, the red circles, that's the model, the powder pattern that's predicted based on the unit cells that we know for thermal isen. And we can make this bigger or smaller um, by moving the, the model detector distance. And we actually needed to do that, and it's even in the tutorial. Uh, so here's what it looks like afterwards. So that's before and after. Oops. No, sorry. Bad. So that's the first step. Now, that kind of got tedious after a while. So for the, for the workshop, we put together this tool, so cspad.quadrants. It does what I just showed you automatically. Um, just takes, actually, let me show you specifically. It doesn't take the whole quadrant. It takes the sensor tile, this rectangle, the four of them that are closest to the direct beam. So it takes them each individually, and it calculates what the autocorrelation of that diffraction pattern would be upon rotating the tile 45 degrees. So um, powder rings should be on top of each other, and they should correlate. And by doing that, uh, as a function of position of the quadrant, we, 
we know where the where the tile should be. And by the way, if anyone knows about sort of numerical methods, I just picked the, the largest pixel. If anyone knows how to fit these uh, these ellipses with the model, I'd be I'd appreciate it. Um, but it actually works uh, the tool. And so now we get. Um, we get displaced quadrants, and these are the x and y coordinates for the displacements. And this is one of the lines that goes in the fill file. So now that we've determined where the quadrant should be, we say distal quad translations equals, and now we've, uh, we've customized the behavior of the software so that it uses these new quadrant positions. Okay, everyone so far? Questions? Ah, well, this, this, what we've done now is we've, because we have this, the new system brings metrology under user rather than developer control. So the way it used to be until maybe a couple weeks ago is that we've collected data ourselves and we've determined the quadrant translations uh, and we've put them, we've hard coded CCTVX so that it has a table. So based on time, so if you type CXI.detector format versions, it basically reiterates for you the history over time of LCLS. So these numbers, three, four, five, six, seven, this corresponds to this to the LCLS run. So it typically lasts for about six months. And every six months, the detector changes, so we redetermine the metrology. But there's a lot of pitfalls to this. First of all, it actually changes more frequently. So 8.1 and 8.2, that corresponded to moving the detector at the end station from the, from the one micron focus to the 100 nanometer focus. And maybe it goes back and forth several times. So as developers, we don't have the coverage to go there each time and redetermine the metrology. And now we don't have to. Because even though the defaults are still there that are hard-coded, you can determine the metrology yourself. OK, so that's quadrant positions. Ah, and the other thing I should mention is there's not only one detector, but there's a downstream detector as well, 2.5 meters beyond the crystal uh, at this end station. And from that one, you can actually measure the 100. So if you're... Uh, I guess, Michael, if you have a really difficult molecular replacement problem, you might want to measure that. Yeah. Right. Um, but within our framework, it's been actually very difficult to process the two detectors together. And we're in a process now of completely redesigning what's inside of our um, our software and taking advantage of the new dials software that Paul Adams mentioned earlier today. Once we are done with this, we'll sort of have a, a, a more logical framework that allows us to put two detectors into one experiment and model them as if they were the same image. And we're going to be doing that. And a lot of work is going, has gone into and will go into implementing this. A lot of this is from Aaron Brewster. Um, and also collaborators such as Herbert Bernstein, who thinks a lot about sort of um, how to do things in a way that can be communicated uh, logically. So one of the things we've come up with is a scheme for using uh, vectors to describe the detector, and in, in our case, two detectors, where we have uh, maybe a vector that starts at the crystal position, hits the center of the detector, and then there's separate vectors that go to the middle of each quadrant, and then the middle of each sensor, and then the middle of each ASIC, and to describe this all together. The other thing this is going to get us when we're done with it is to repackage those pickle files that I talked about before into a more standard format and putting a lot of data into an HDF5 container. Uh, we've heard this idea before today, and we're also doing that as well. So that's a sort of a side. And now um, I'm going to go back to the issue of metrology. And the first step that I talked about, the placement of the quadrants, that was just the first step. Then we have to look at each sensor and how it's positioned within the quadrant. Um, and to do this, we look at Bragg spots. So we take either one, well, we take one thermal isen image with many thousands of them, and then we plot the positions of spots on each sensor with respect to where we predicted them to be based on indexing and what does the lattice model tell us. 
and that's this plot here. So this tells us that on average, we expect the pixels to be about maybe 0.6 pixels different from where they are. So that means we have to shift our model of the detector over uh, by a fraction of a pixel. So we do that and we have a very sort of large procedure to do iterative refinement of both the, the, the detector tile positions, but also the, um, the orientations of all the 10,000 crystals we use for this. And we do that all together. There's a tool called CSPAD Metrology that does that for you. And in the end, it just gives you some output that tells you where the tiles should be translated. And this is this line here gives you tiles to the nearest pixel. And then there's actually a separate, uh, there's a separate way to enter this into the fill file for the fractional pixel corrections and rotations of the tile. So when all is said and done, in the case of thermalysin, we were able to get the rack spots predicted to within 0.65 pixels of where we thought they were going to be. And uh, that's pretty good. It's not, it's not the best. But actually, so in answer to John Spence's question from before, what did you ask? You said, how close are we to determining, how, how does metrology figure into the question about partiality? Right? So actually, I'll, <laughs> Let me, let me lead into that question by saying, so does any of this matter? And the answer is yes, it does. And this is work that Johan did um, in our Nature Methods paper. So here's what he's done. Uh, what these curves do is they take away, they subtract the metrology corrections that we've already done. So we, we start here with perfect metrology um, here on this line. And we say we can, we can index this many images, or we can get this many images that actually seem to have bright spots um, in the highest resolution bin. And as we make the metrology worse by perturbing the sensors, maybe one pixel, the number of images that contain high resolution information <laughs> dramatically decreases. So we go from, what is it, 3,000 to 1,800 or something. And with two pixels, two thirds of the high resolution information goes away. So the answer, part of the answer is that a one pixel perturbation does make a big difference, especially at the high resolution limit. Okay, so that's one part of the answer. Second part is that in this number that I showed you, the 0.6 pixels, what it doesn't show is that, okay, let me see if I get the, the um, ah, yes, here's the answer. If you look at the, per, the, the, the displacement observed minus predicted spot position um, in the radial direction or the azimuthal direction, it's very different. There's much more of an error in the radial direction. So that could be due to um, wavelength spread. I'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing it's likely to be due to is the thickness of the sensor. So the sense the silicon is half a millimeter thick, and that creates a, a parallax effect. I don't take that into account, and we're we're sort of on the dials framework does correct for that. I, I hope that once we implement that, um, things will get a lot better really quick. I don't know if you've thought about Tom. Have you, have you done this parallax correction? No. I mean, it must be on the order of a pixel. The ring integration is quite a lot less sensitive to yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Anyway, I think that's part of the answer, Johnny, and it's a long-winded answer to your question. Um, the other thing, we've looked at this, you know, the question about accuracy from many different angles. Um, here, so here as a, so this is just, this is lysozyme images, 50 chosen at random. And for each image, I'm plotting as a function of resolution, the RMS displacement of what we see versus what we expect. And as you go to higher and higher resolution, the model gets worse, which kind of is what you expect. But it, it also means that it, it feeds into the argument I've been making before about how at a certain point, the lattice model gets so bad that you're not really predicting spots where they are. You're one pixel or two pixels off. That's this Y dimension. Uh, it actually never gets as bad as two pixels. But yeah, 
the weaker spots, so that bigger arm has values. Therefore, when you've got a higher resolution, there are no weaker spots. So I think it just reflects that the higher resolution is weaker. Right, so these, um, the, these, these. Can you repeat the question. Um, I'm not sure that I can. <laughs> <laughs> so the weaker spots have, in my experience, have much bigger variation in their position. Uh, yeah, because there's no real profile to fit. And the high resolution data has more weaker spots. So you, this is the kind of response I would expect. Right, but but in this graph, I'm only plotting the bright the bright spots that are bright enough to be identified by sort of an unbiased spot finding program. Okay, so but I mean it does find some high resolution, but at a certain point, uh, the, the black dot for each image, the black dot represents the highest resolution that I was able to get with, with a spot finder. So the question is, can I then use the lattice model to predict spots that are higher resolution than the brightest spots? And my answer is no. My answer is that the lattice model gets worse and worse as you get the higher angle. And therefore, we like to, for each image, we separately cut off the resolution at a different value. And I think that's a conservative thing to do, acknowledging that as you go to higher resolution, the, the model isn't good enough. You actually need data or bright data to get the best lattice model. So that's an approach we've taken in CCTVX um, to try to get better merge data is just to cut off the resolution separately for each, for each image. Okay, I'm gonna go on and I'm gonna talk about how this, this also has to do with can we predict spots on an image with a lattice model? So here's a, here's a crystal. Here's some rotations I can do on the crystal. So what happens, let's, let's test our understanding of diffractions. Uh, what happens if we rotate the crystal around this axis, uh, Z? Well, the diffraction pattern rotates the same way the crystal does. So here's the question. What if I rotate the crystal by a tiny fraction of a degree along Rx or the x-axis or the y-axis? Anybody volunteer? What happens to the diffraction pattern and the spot positions? Anyone know? Yeah, both game. So they stay the same, but the intensity? That's right. That's right. So if I'm trying to refine the model of the lattice based on the positions of spots, it doesn't tell me about the x-axis or the y-axis. The intensities differ. You're right. Some spots move in to diffracting condition and some move out. But the, I, can't, I can't refine the crystal orientation based on the positions of spots. We, we get around this at the synchrotron because we rotate the crystal on a goniometer and we view the crystal at many different rotational settings. And that is, that is a big difference from what we're doing here where the crystals are absolutely still. Okay, so we had to come up with something to, to try to handle this. Um, here's our first approximation. We came up, th this is the normal target function we use to refine the crystal model the observed versus calculated positions of spots. That's this term. We added a new term that had to do with this delta phi angle. It's basically a characterization of how far the spot is from the ideal uh, Ewald sphere or the ideal diffraction condition. So um, in yellow here, or actually in orange, this shows the spots that we actually see on the image. So this spot is not exactly on the Ewald sphere, and yet we do see it on the image. So part of that problem, or part of that reason, is that the model is wrong. And if we could rotate around X or Y, and then we would get the spots better so that they're touching the Ewald sphere. And that's what this term in our new target function does. Okay, so that's what we do in CCTBX. There's another aspect to this. There's, there's different ways of drawing these reciprocal lattice points. On the left-hand side, this is the model of 
sort of what what is what does the reciprocal lattice and what do reciprocal lattice points look like if there's mosaicity in the crystal? So what is mosaicity? Again, it's just that there are different microscopic domains that are oriented differently. Um, and that means that it spreads the, the reciprocal lattice points out. So what was a single point is now spread out into a spherical cap. Part of that spherical cap is intersecting the Ewald sphere. And there's even this angle, like I showed here, delta psi, which is what you would, yeah. So I guess I'm taking up some of Aaron's time. So I'm not, even, not even close. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so th this is the this is the picture of mosaicity. Now, look at what this predicts. Because at smaller angles, the mosaic spots are smaller. This would predict that there are many more reflections on expel images at high resolution than there are at low resolution. This isn't true. We see plenty of low resolution spots. So this model doesn't tell us the whole story. Here's a different model where all the reciprocal lattice points are the same size. Uh, I call it D-effective. And that reflects, in reciprocal space, the size of the mosaic block, or the average size of mosaic blocks that are coherently scattering. So here, I, I have two separate models, mosaicity and domain size. And I actually use them both together in CCTBX. I add up those two effects to model the spots that I predict. And we're coming out with a new paper that says how we do it. It's a maximum likelihood target function. Here's how to get that code in your fill file. Integration.mosaic.refinementTarget equals ML. So in all the examples that we worked in, uh, you have to put that in your fill file. OK. Um, yeah, I think maybe in the interest of time, I'll skip ahead. We do think about partiality. Um, Mona in Axel Brunger's lab has implemented code that deals with partiality. Also, as mentioned before, um, Helen Ginn and David Stewart's group was able to solve this polyhedron structure, again, by molecular replacement. And it was a difficult molecular replacement problem. It only had 10% sequence identity. And she was only able to do this once she had corrected the intensities for partiality. Um, with this simple sort of model. I, maybe I, I should be more explicit. The distance between the spot and the mathematically precise Ewald sphere, that's a, in some sense a measure of what the partiality is. The closer it is to the Ewald sphere, the closer the partiality gets to one. So it's just these types of ideas that we're implementing to, to do the correction. And uh, I think, without going into this in any detail, I would urge people to, once, once you have done these things and corrected the data as best you can, run the data through phoenix.xtriage, which tells you different quality measures that are based on things like the moments of the intensity distribution. And these types of tests are often used to detect twinning. But in our case, I think they can be used to detect the types of systematic errors that I'm trying to deal with when I process data. So this slide, in a long-winded way, just says that once we've applied a, a rough partiality correction, we get better statistics for the data, for the whole data set, than, than before. OK. Um, Wolfgang will talk later about the algorithms for correcting indexing ambiguities. I won't talk about it at all, except to say that we've implemented uh, this, uh, these excellent algorithms. CXI.bremdiederix is, and it's actually documented on the wiki, not in the tutorial, but on a different part of the wiki, uh, resolving an indexing ambiguity. So again, I. <laughs> There was two purposes to this slide. One is that it just shows that some images have two different lattices. In this case, the, the red and the blue. Uh, the other, and we, we have a facility to, in, to integrate two different lattices on an image. The other is it's very hard to see, but as I said before, or maybe I didn't say before, as when you get out very far angles from the direct beam, the spots tend to be more streaked. And that has something to do with the, the dispersion of the, of the incident uh, pulse. We've actually measured the, uh, the spectrum of the X-ray pulses, and they differ on every shot. Um, and they actually streak out 
the brag spots, it's, I, I think it's, it, it's going to take too much time to go through the construction. Aaron Brewster put these slides together that show this is a monochromatic uh, geometry. It gets you a uh, brag spot in a certain place. Um, then you, you add in mosaicity, and then you add in uh, a dispersed beam, and you end up being able to observe spots that are mosaic, but the, the fraction of, of X-ray energies that illuminate each spot can be different. So this particular Bragg spot is just in between the high and the low energy limits or limiting Ewald spheres, so it's completely within the diffraction condition. Whereas this Bragg spot, again, a mosaic Bragg spot, is only partially illuminated by the spectrum of energies in the shot. So this, this one corresponds to this very short Bragg spot, and this one corresponds to this very long one. And you can see they're, they're adjacent Bragg spots, but they're different shapes and sizes based on a simple model that takes into account mosaicity and um, the wavelength dispersion. Now, Johan took those three parameters and he modeled this thermal Ison image and he found just the right parameters that sort of give you what the Bragg spots uh, model agrees with what we see. Uh, but this feature is not really implemented. This is, it's somewhere, but it's not exposed to the user, I would say. So this, this is still future developments. Uh, to be able to do that. So that's that's a way of using software to compensate for the wide spectral dispersion. Or you can just change the experiment and using use self-seeding instead of SASI X-ray pulses. So this is data from May this year, taken with uh, Soichi and uh, Bill Weiss and Axel Brunger at Stanford. This is also lysozyme uh, derivative, derivatized with um, uh, ytterbium. Uh, we did two types of experiments, one where we seeded uh, to get a monochromatic pulse or where we seeded uh, two colors to be uh, right on the edge or at a high remote energy. Um, this is very preliminary results where we're just doing a normalist Fourier uh, to show that we can see the heavy atom. And this shows, you know, sure enough, when in the two color experiment, that the crystals really do act like spectral analyzers, so you can see the two colors uh, that correspond to, Bragg, to each Bragg spot. And uh, so just in summary, yes, there are many sources of systematic error, many of which were already mentioned, crystal volume, variable flux, detector, metrology, stochastic spectrum, non-isomorphism. Hopefully, Oliver will tell us a little bit about that later on. Um, but I think in the end, you have to be sort of very uh, systematic about it and actually measure your success. So, you know, really look at what is the RMS displacement of your lattice model versus the observed. Look at the intensity statistics with Phoenix X triage. The other one to look at in X triage is the Wilson B factor. A smaller B factor gives you a sharper map. Uh, certainly R factors and ultimately the peak height and the anomalous Fourier map. So, you know, many, many groups have contributed both to the software development and to the data that we've used. So they're all listed here. I'll stop there and take questions. Oh, okay, I have a question. Did you look at the quality of the data when it was seeded versus when it wasn't? Since it looks like your program may be more affected by that than Yeah, the, no. Oh. The, it's, it's very much in progress. Okay. Like the fellows in my group are we're working on that now. Yeah, okay. About intensity distribution, like this program, you you show this program of the intensity distribution in the beginning? Um, how it would look like if, if you assume a Gaussian distribution, because I think it would look very much the same. Maybe we should talk about this offline. Yeah. I, I, haven't, I haven't really gone beyond like thinking about how would different errors affect those distributions. That's a very interesting question, so maybe we should talk about it.